What also gives off carbon monoxide is mould. And I would say in nine times out of ten, when someone comes to our retreat with chronic fatigue syndrome, there's, there's a mould factor. There was one lady, she, she was a scientist from Russia. She came to Australia and was working hard, but she eventually could not work. She went to the doctor and she said, look, I, I live in an apartment that's a bit damp. He said, it's got nothing to do with it. She went home and she struggled on for a long time. And then eventually she found a specialist that specialises in chronic fatigue syndrome. When she went to see him, the first question he asked was, tell me about the house you live in. Does your doctor ever ask you that? Does your specialist ever ask you that? He said, tell me about the house you live in. She said, well, I'm on the bottom floor of a set of apartments. He said, yes. She said, my apartment gets no sun. So in America, in the northern hemisphere, your sunny side is your southern side. Well, in Australia, our southern side is the no sun side. She said, I don't get any sun. She said, maybe in the middle of summer, a tiny bit in the morning and afternoon. He said, tell me more. He said, tell me about your bedroom. She said, oh, all my leather shoes, my leather belts, my leather bags, they all go mouldy. She said, the ceiling of my apartment in my bedroom is, is often black. She said, I'm always cleaning it. He said, you cannot go back to that house. He said, you cannot sleep one more night in that house if you want to conquer your chronic fatigue syndrome. Whoa, that was a challenge to her. She said, what am I going to do? He said, I'll leave it up to you. <laughs> he said, this is my advice if you want to heal. Well, she was able to salvage a few things. She just found it easier. She, she really just got rid of a lot of things. She was only in her mid-40s and she, she loved her work, but she had not been able to work because of this chronic fatigue syndrome she had. She was constantly weary. She told me that she found another apartment. Her doctor gave her a, a medical certificate to give to her landlord to say that you know she could no longer be in that house because of the, the mould factor. And she moved. She said she began to heal. <laughs> it took a while to get that, that yeast and that fungus out of her body because she'd been breathing it in for a couple of years. But she said that she eventually conquered it. The most vital element needed for life is oxygen. You can go three months without eating, though you wouldn't be too well. You can go three days without water, although I, I read an account recently where a couple was, was uh, stranded in a desert and they went nearly five days without water. But you can only go three minutes without oxygen. Oxygen is the most vital element needed for life. And it makes a lot of sense that the more oxygen we can get into our body, the more alive our body will be, especially when you consider that cancer cannot live in the presence of oxygen. So what I'd like to do in this presentation, I'd like to have a look at what increases the oxygen content of the body and what decreases. So first of all, let us go to the cell. We're going to go once again to this CBD of the human body. The central business district of the human body is the inside workings of the cell. We've already looked at this a couple of times, so I'll just recap. The glucose goes in, it goes through a 20-step pathway. The 20-step pathway, the glycolytic pathway, gives us two units of energy. It's what's commonly called an anaerobic pathway. Anaerobic because 
it doesn't use oxygen, it produces energy by the process of fermentation. The end result of the 20-step pathway is a chemical form of glucose called pyruvate. Pyruvate, as the chemical form of glucose, gets fed into what's commonly called the powerhouse. It's the mitochondria, the little Krebs cycle inside the mitochondria. It's an eight-step pathway and it's called the powerhouse because of its ability to give us 36 units of energy. That's a big difference. What a difference oxygen makes. So this is the aerobic pathway. We have 100 trillion cells in our body. How are you going to feel if every single one of your 100 trillion cells has enough oxygen to get down to the 36th energy producing powerhouse pathway? You're going to be jumping out of your skin with energy. So what I'd like to look at is what increases and what decreases. The most powerful way to oxygenate the cell is exercise. I'm not going to explore exercise right now. Just to comment that when you're running up that hill or when you're doing that 30 push-ups, when you're doing any type of exercise that gets the heart rate up and increases respiration, instead of breathing in and out 500 mil like you're possibly doing now if you're just sitting watching this presentation, when you're to the peak of your exercise, you're breathing in 3,600 mil of air and you're breathing out 3,600 mil of waste. Powerful. Let's have a look at what oxygen does. Oxygen vitalizes. That's how you're going to feel. Oxygen vitalizes. Oxygen invigorates. I would even go so far as to say oxygen electrifies. I know when I was homeschooling my children, if it looks like they were getting a little bit weary of their, of their studies, we would call a break. In fact, we'd try and have a break after every subject, even just a five minute, where they ran up and down the hill or they rode their bike up and down the hill a few times or they went and jumped on the trampoline or they got the skip rope and went up and down. And when they came back, they're breathing like this, their faces lit up and everything in their workbooks looks different because now their brain cells are pumping out 36 units of energy. Oxygen, and it almost seems like the opposite, but oxygen soothes the nerves. We had a lady in her 30s who did our program and she had a little tattoo on her wrist and it said, just breathe. And I said, I'm intrigued. <laughs> I'm intrigued to the reason for your tattoo. She said, well, I used to get panic attacks. She said, I was medication. I was not happy with, with the way my life was going. I was not happy. I started to think, am I going to be on this medication for the rest of my life? So she said, I decided to take control. Oh, I love those stories. I believe that God meant each one of us to be our own doctor because only you know how you feel, only you know what you've been through and only you know how your body reacts or responds to the different things that are happening to it. She said, I decided to take control. And she said, what triggered me, I was watching a guy on YouTube called Wim Hof. I don't know if you've heard of Wim Hof. My sons think Wim Hof is great and they follow him. This guy climbs Himalayan mountains in shorts and t-shirts in the snow and he controls his temperature, he controls the way his body responds to things by breathing. And what this breathing is doing is blasting oxygen in at the cellular level. She said, I started deep breathing. And whenever I'd get stressed, I'd go into the, the Wim Hof way of breathing. One, two, she said, and then I'd hold it and let it out. She said, I'd, I'd breathe quite a few times. She said, I eventually got off my medication. She said, I was so excited. So she said, I decided to tattoo that on my wrist. Now I'm not I'm not suggesting we all need to tattoo that on our wrist, but it certainly helped this lady. She said, 
That's the story behind just breathe, just breathe, just breathe. So whenever you're a little stressed, whenever things aren't going right, just breathe. Remember the tattoo. <laughs> just breathe. Take some very deep breaths because oxygen soothes the nerves. On the other hand, we've got a medical condition called hypoxia. And hypoxia basically means lack of oxygen at the cellular level. And the paramedic is trained to look for hypoxia. Blue top lip, blue fingertips. You see, when, when this blood cell goes through the lungs, it picks up oxygen like a little parcel. It forms an unstable union. And look at the colour it gives the blood cell. It is oxygen that causes the blood cell to have a bright red colour. Why is it an unstable union? It's an unstable union so that that oxygen can be dropped again in my brain, in my pancreas, in my toes, in my liver, anywhere that it is needed. Maybe I'm running, it can be dropped into my muscle cells to give me that extra energy. When we do not have enough oxygen going in, a lot of the cells are running anaerobically and eventually the person can die when when, the, when no oxygen is getting in at all. I have a friend who's a surgeon. She said, in surgery, you can tell venous blood to arterial blood. Arterial blood comes away from the heart and the lungs and it's bright red. Whereas venous blood, when it's going back, it can have a slightly blue tinge because it's lost its oxygen. But there are many people today who are not quite to the blue lip stage but they are suffering from hypoxia. Look at their symptoms. Fatigue, also lethargy. What am I describing here? In fact, medicine gives it a name, is that right? Chronic fatigue syndrome. Lethargy, nausea. The cells lining the stomach don't have enough oxygen. Also headache. The brain cells don't have enough oxygen. I find that there are many people I meet today that are drifting in the haze that lies between optimum health and severe illness. They're not jumping out of their skin with energy and they're not bedridden. Do you find that? They're just whew, in the middle. And if you ask them how they are, what's the answer? Not too bad. What's not too bad? Not too good. And if you say to the person with chronic fatigue syndrome, do you exercise? What's the answer? You don't understand. I don't have energy. Well, guess how you get it? <laughs> you start exercising. One lady said, I heard this. So she said, the first day I walked around the house. Next day I walked around the house twice. Third day, three times, fourth day, four times. She said, by then I felt I could go around the block. Can you see what she's doing? Little by little by little, as she can, she goes a little bit more, a little bit more. Now this, this whole process here explains the saying that you will receive more energy than you expend on your exercise program. Not only because you're out in the fresh air, but also because your breathing changes and you're getting so much more fresh air, which of course is oxygen, into the body. There is one cause of chronic fatigue syndrome, that is lack of oxygen at the cellular level. Now there can be a lot of reasons for this lack of oxygen and we're going to be having a look at that. Let's have a look at the air. Some air contains negative ions. Negative ions are electrically charged oxygen molecules. To create negative ions, we need three things. You see, water droplets pass through the air, casting off negative ions. Three things, water, passing, that's movement, and air. Wherever there's movement, moisture, and air, you'll get negative ions. The negative ions refers to the negative charge. So you'll find negative ions when the thunderstorm hits. And isn't the air just beautiful when the thunderstorm hits? We can almost smell those negative ions. You'll also find negative ions at waterfalls. I've never been to Niagara Falls. 
or Victoria Falls. I certainly hope <laughs> that I get there one day, but I'm told the air there is alive. Yes, it's alive with the negative ions. You'll also find negative ions at the ocean waves. I was always happy and still am when my sons choose surfing or spearfishing for, <laughs> for a, a pastime because where are they? They're down by that sea getting that negative ions in. You'll also find negative ions in the pine forest. You'll find negative ions in every forest, but you'll find more in the pine forest because the needles are so fine and so numerous and they're so light that just the lightest breath of wind will get those needles moving. So they're giving off a little bit more negative ions than other trees. On the other hand, we've got positive ions and positive ions have more carbon dioxide in their molecule than oxygen. So you'll find the positive ions before the thunderstorm. I think we can all appreciate it that before the thunderstorm, the air is heavy. It's heavy with positive ions and it's not uncommon for people to experience these symptoms before a thunderstorm. You'll also find positive ions in the city. And the reason that you find the positive ions in the city is, I guess, the smog. So what causes the smog? A lot of people and all those people are breathing out carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is the waste, the gaseous waste given off from the combustion of oxygen and glucose at the cellular level. And some of those people are smoking and cigarette smoke particularly gives off another gas called carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is dangerous to humans because carbon monoxide competes with oxygen on the blood cell. So when a person's breathing in oxygen and carbon monoxide, the carbon monoxide grabs it first because the carbon monoxide forms a stable union. So it's going to grab it first. And you will find in wards where patients are having their limbs amputated that they're usually smokers because when they're smoking, they're breathing in carbon monoxide and oxygen. And by the time the blood gets down to the extremities, there's no oxygen left. And so the, the toes start to be without oxygen. If there's no oxygen, then the, basically they start to die. Another place where you can find carbon monoxide is coming off from car fumes. So cars give off carbon monoxide. I often question the wisdom of the morning walkers or runners on the side of the road. <laughs> because if you're jogging on the side of the road, you're breathing in more oxygen, but you're also breathing in more car fumes. So please be mindful as to where you do your exercise. I was traveling once and where I was staying had a gym. So I went down to the gym, I opened the door and all I smelt was very strong BO. So I shut the door and decided to go on a walk down by the river. <laughs> if I owned a gym, I'd have a lot of plants in there because plants take in our carbon dioxide and give off oxygen. I'd also have a lot of windows open and I'd have, a, have the fan on. What also gives off carbon monoxide is mold. And I would say in nine times out of 10, when someone comes to our retreat with chronic fatigue syndrome, there's, there's a mold factor. There was one lady, she, she was a scientist from Russia. She came to Australia and was working hard, but she eventually could not work. She went to the doctor and she said, look, I, I live in an apartment that's a bit damp. He said, it's got nothing to do with it. She went home and she struggled on for a long time. And then eventually she found a specialist that specialises in chronic fatigue syndrome. When she went to see him, the first question he asked was, tell me about the house you live in. Does your doctor ever ask you that? Does your specialist ever ask you that? He said, tell me about the house you live in. She said, well, I'm on the bottom floor of a set of apartments. 
He said, yes. She said, my apartment gets no sun. So in America, in the Northern Hemisphere, your sunny side is your Southern side. Well, in Australia, our Southern side is the no sun side. She said, I don't get any sun. She said, maybe in the middle of summer, a tiny bit in the morning and afternoon. He said, tell me more. He said, tell me about your bedroom. She said, oh, all my leather shoes, my leather belts, my leather bags, they all go mouldy. She said, the ceiling of my apartment in my bedroom is, is often black. She said, I'm always cleaning it. He said, you cannot go back to that house. He said, you cannot sleep one more night in that house if you want to conquer your chronic fatigue syndrome. Whoa, that was a challenge to her. She said, what am I going to do? He said, I'll leave it up to you. <laughs> he said, this is my advice if you want to heal. Well, she was able to salvage a few things. She just found it easier. She, she really just got rid of a lot of things. She was only in her mid-40s and she, she loved her work, but she had not been able to work because of this chronic fatigue syndrome she had. She was constantly weary. She told me that she found another apartment. Her doctor gave her a, a medical certificate to give to her landlord to say that, you know, she could no longer be in that house because of the, the mould factor. And she moved. She said she began to heal. <laughs> it took a while to get that, that yeast and that fungus out of her body because she'd been breathing it in for a couple of years. But she said that she eventually conquered it. So be careful of the mould. In fact, we talked about that this morning, how dangerous it is. I had another young man, only 22, with chronic fatigue syndrome. He used to work out at the gym. He was a surfy. I said, what do you do for a job? He said, I'm an air conditioning mechanic. I said, aha. As an apprentice, he was sent to all the rotten jobs, <laughs> the old air conditioners that often had, had mould growing in them because it's a moist, damp area. When he discovered what was the contributing factor to his chronic fatigue syndrome, he was so excited. He said, you know what the doctor wants to put me on now? He said, antidepressants. <laughs> I've also had two men do our program who got depression six months after moving into a mouldy house. Where are their brain cells running? A lot of them are running up here. Only two units of energy instead of the 36. So this can be the cause of chronic fatigue syndrome. So be careful of the air that you're breathing. Investigate your house and see how it is. But there's more. I mentioned earlier that I used to do a live blood analysis. And sometimes the blood would be clumped. You see, the blood should look like this. It should just about bounce, they should be just about bouncing off each other. Now, when that goes through the lungs, it picks up oxygen like a little parcel, as I just mentioned. But if someone's dehydrated, then the blood cells can clump like this. Now, when the blood cells are clumped like that and they go through the lungs, how much oxygen are they picking up? Not a lot. Someone can suffer from chronic fatigue syndrome because of lack of oxygen. And that cause of that lack of oxygen could be as simple as dehydration. We had a pathologist do our program. He said, Barbara, we did studies on, on coffee. He said, we discovered you need five glasses of water to account for the dehydrating agents in one cup of coffee. Oh, that's a little scary, isn't it? How many people today are dehydrated? How many people today are suffering from this, fatigue, lethargy. They don't have the quality of life anymore. And how many people blame age, poor old age? It gets blamed for too many things, doesn't it? Far too many things. Also, you can suffer from chronic fatigue syndrome 
purely because you're not breathing with your abdominal muscles. Your abdominal muscles were designed to aid in the breathing process. So it's important to strengthen your abdominal muscles. Last lecture we talked about the core. Here are your core muscles. We should all be doing push-ups every day. Ladies, if you can't quite do it, do, do ladies' push-ups. If you can't even do ladies' push-ups, do push-ups on the wall. And when you get, remember, the further out from the wall you go, the, <laughs> the more effort it takes. And then eventually go down to the floor, strengthen those abdominal muscles. Rebounding is a great way to strengthen your abdominal muscles. When your abdominal muscles are strong, they cause you to stand upright. And when you stand upright, it's easy to use your abdominal muscles in the breathing process. As I also mentioned in our last lecture, we should be breathing with our nose and our abdomen. We should be nose abdominal breathers because nose purifies the air. Nose warms the air. Nose moistens the air. Become nose abdominal breathers. So what we've just done here is we've assessed law number one. We're investigating these eight laws of health, which are the true remedies. Now we're going to have a look at the second law. And the second law is sunshine. The sun is not the enemy in the sky. The sun is the doctor in the sky. The sun's rays should be touching our body every day. It is true that six to, six to ten sunburns in your lifetime can double your risk of skin cancer because when your skin gets burned, it damages the skin. So here's sun and there are rays coming out of the sun. And the rays that are the most important for us are the UVB rays. When the UVB rays touch the skin, they convert a form of cholesterol just under the skin. Here we go again. Another reason why cholesterol is vital. Remember in his book, The Great Cholesterol Con, Dr. Malcolm Kendrick, he said, for the first time, normal levels of a normal vital body substance is being called a disease. So the UVB rays from the sun hit the skin. They convert a form of cholesterol just under the skin to vitamin D. And vitamin D is essential for the assimilation and the utilisation of calcium. Calcium's called the king because when calcium gets into the cell, Here's the king, and this is the reason why when calcium gets into the cell, all the other minerals piggyback on the back of calcium to get into the cell. But I've got some shocking news for you. Bones are not made of calcium. Well, what are bones made of? Bones are made of 12 minerals and 64 trace. That's what bones are made of. So what are those minerals? Yes, calcium is one, and boron, and chromium, and iron, and magnesium, and manganese, and selenium, and silica, and sulfur, and potassium, and phosphorus, and zinc, and 64 trace. That's what bones are made of. So it's not rocket science to determine what bones need. Bones don't need calcium. In fact, if you take calcium supplements to strengthen your bones, you will not strengthen your bones because bones are not made of calcium. Bones are made of 12 main minerals and 64 trace minerals. So it's not rocket science. That's what our bones need. So how can we get that? In the book, The Calcium Lie, Dr. Robert Thompson, he claims that seawater is the clearest indication of a creator God. Because that seawater is called an isotonic solution. It has the exact same minerals in balance and proportion as is found in body fluids, in the blood, in the tissues, in the lymph and in the bones. But I've got some good news. You don't, you don't have to drink seawater. But what you can do is before each glass of water, take a little crystal of Celtic salt 
Celtic salt contains 82 minerals. Here are all the minerals in the perfect balance and proportion as is found in the bones. So your Celtic salt. If you can't get Celtic salt, you can use Himalayan salt. Himalayan salt contains 75 minerals, so that's still pretty good. Taking a little crystal of Celtic salt, Dr. Robert Thompson states, just before you start each glass of water, all that does is replace the salt that you lost yesterday. So the Celtic salt provides the minerals that your bones need. If you just take calcium, it's coming into the body in an unbalanced form. And often the body has to dump it in the kidneys, kidney stones, gallstones. We need to take it the way God meant us to take it, which is in its balanced form. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, Jesus said, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. How does the salt lose its savour? It's old English. I'd like to suggest that Table salt has lost its savour. It only has two minerals, sodium chloride. That's all it's got. And yet our body, our tissues, it needs the whole balance. It needs the whole lot of minerals, not just sodium chloride. In fact, taking sodium chloride in that form into the body, they're very harsh minerals. They harden the arteries, they cause imbalance in and out of the cells, contributing to high blood pressure is not a good salt. Where else can we get these minerals? Where does the orangutan get the nutrients it needs for strong bones? Where does the cow, the giraffe, the elephant? They're all vegetarian. They're not drinking milk. Oh, they drank their mother's milk as babies, but notice that they didn't drink another creature's milk. We are the only creature that drinks another creature's milk. Where did they get their minerals for their strong bones? They got their minerals for their strong bones from greens, green grass. I've got some good news. We don't have to, we don't have to eat grass. We can eat kale and we can eat lettuce, and we can eat spinach, silver beet. I've been in Alabama. We had a lovely meal of collard greens. We're, we're not familiar with collard greens in Australia. I've got some good news. When you cook these greens, you don't lose the minerals. You only lose the minerals if you throw the water away. So dark green leafy vegetables, dark green. Dark green leafy vegetables have these minerals in the balance that our body needs them. In fact, the countries in this world that are the highest dairy consumers have the highest incidence of osteoporosis. So our bones need sunshine to give us vitamin D to allow us to assimilate and absorb the minerals into our bodies. And the good news is, you don't need a lot of sunshine. If you've got what I heard called recently, like me, a milky skin, you need to be careful how much sun you get. So when Michael and I went on a holiday a few months ago to Cairns, that's up the top of Australia, and I laid out in the sun by the pool every morning, I had my watch and I timed myself. 15 minutes front, 15 minutes back, then under the umbrella. And within five days, I had a very nice tan. No sunscreen. Sunscreen today contains nanoparticles. What are nanoparticles? They're little particles in such small proportions that they now finding they're getting into marine life. They can get through the blood-brain barrier. Zinc oxide is not toxic to the body, but if it's in nanoparticle form, it is. My son was up the top of Australia and he got a boat ride out to the Great Barrier Reef. 50 years ago, you could stand on the shore and look at the Great Barrier Reef. You've heard of Australia's Great Barrier Reef, no more. 
fact, Michael and I recently, when we were in Cairns, we got on a boat, an hour and a half we had to drive out before we could see the Great Barrier Reef. So my son was with a, with a boat and the driver, and he was talking to the driver, and the driver said, you know why we've lost our Great Barrier Reef? We've lost our Great Barrier Reef because of sunscreens. He said, every Aussie, just about, that goes into that water has sunscreens on. Those sunscreens are going into that coral life and killing it. It can also get through the blood-brain barrier. And you know what sunscreens block? UVB rays. So people can be suffering from vitamin D deficiency because of the sunscreens that they are wearing. So when you go out into the sun, like me, time yourself, especially if you've got milky skin, the darker the skin, the more sun you need. If you've got very dark skin, you need about 10 times the sun that I need to get the vitamin D levels. The middle of the day, the sun's the strongest, but the middle of the day, you get to go out for short periods. For longer periods of time, you go out in the morning and in the afternoon. I think we know that. That, that sun is particularly burny in the middle of the day. That, that, there's our common sense, isn't it? People have been living in the sun for centuries. But skin cancer has only really been prominent in the last, what, 20, 30, 40 years? And listen to the figures from Norway. Since I think it was uh, 90s, 1990s to the 2000s, they found that sun cancer rates increased 600% in Norway. And the two things they put it down to was that Norwegians aren't spending as much time outdoors. They're spending more time indoors. And the Norwegians are now wearing sunscreen. So they put it down to those two things. They're wearing sunscreen and they're not out in the sun enough. You see, the sun plays a protective role. Obviously, if you overdo it, you're going to get burnt. But we've got another problem today. People are underdoing the sun. So we need to do wisdom and go out there for little bits, little bits, and little by little, get used to the sun. Little by little, build up that tan. If you have dark skin, please go out there much more. They're finding today that, that vitamin D deficiency is a contributing factor with skin cancer. That's what the Norwegian study showed. And we need that UVB rays. They're the protective rays. The UVB tan is a tan that will protect. The UVB tan is a tan that will last a long time. So when I got my UVB tan, I still had that tan months later. Your bones need the sun to get the vitamin D. You need to have nice amounts of cholesterol. Ideally, not under 180 ideally above. Exposure to the sun, but also taking into the body the minerals that God designed that we have. Here is the molecular structure of blood. Here is the molecular structure of chlorophyll, which basically is plant blood. They look almost identical, don't they? So here's the plant and here's the human. This one's red, this one's green. The only difference is the middle molecule. In human blood, the middle molecule is iron. In plant blood, the middle molecule is magnesium. So a great way to cleanse the blood is green drinks. A great way to build the blood is green drinks. What do I mean by green drinks? In a previous lecture, I, I mentioned how we gather wild greens, blend it with water, strain it, especially our people that are conquering cancer, and they drink that drink. It cleanses the blood and cleanses the tissues. So we need the greens, we need the whole salts, and we need the sunshine. We also need to stop certain things. We looked at this a little earlier because there are stimulants that are leaching the minerals out of the body. 
So one is the refined sugar. Another one is the caffeine. So the caffeine, this is in chocolate, it's in, in tea, it's in green tea. Green tea still has caffeine. Coffee, all your uh, caffeinated soda drinks that have caffeine, like your Red Bulls, your, your Coca-Colas, Pepsis, um, Dr. Peppers. Also alcohol and tobacco. Did you know that teeth can heal themselves? Teeth are exposed bone. And I have said, I have had many people testify this and I even saw it in my own children. A little bit of decay began, but it, it healed itself. How does it heal itself? Through two fluids. The inside fluid is your blood and your lymph. And the outside fluid is your saliva. And your saliva is affected by your nutrition. Your inside fluids is affected by your nutrition. Also, the saliva and the, the out fluid and the in fluid are affected by how hydrated you are, how well slept you are, how exercised you are. If you're giving the body the right conditions, those fluids are able to heal. But also, Dental health is important. I talked about oil pulling this morning, strengthens the gum and cleans the mouth nicely. But dental floss is very important. One dentist said, only floss the teeth you want to keep. See, when you don't get those little bits of food articles away from between your teeth, it's a warm environment and it causes bacteria to start feeding. That's what, remember, that's what bacteria does. It feeds on the, on the uh, I was going to say rotten or break, it, it encourages the breakdown. But those articles of food in your teeth, they're not living things, are they? They, they, they break down. Have you ever flossed your teeth and then smelt it? <laughs> I think rotten's the word, is that right? So it's important to rinse your mouth after every meal. Rinse it, rinse it and release it out. Rinse it with salt water solution or sodium bicarbonate solution. Floss your teeth. Even put a little bit of essential oil um, on that floss. Floss those teeth and then rinse again. Try and oil pull two or three times a day. You will save a fortune <laughs> because you won't have to go to the dentist. I don't know anyone that likes going to the dentist. So please look after those teeth because that's one of the reasons those teeth deteriorate and teeth are exposed, they're the only exposed bone in the body. One writer said, putting a drill in your mouth is like putting a chainsaw in your mouth. Allow your teeth to heal by giving them the right conditions. Your eyes need sun. And the reason why your eyes need sun is because your brain needs sun. And it's your eyes that take the light through to the brain. The ultraviolet rays from the sun go through neurochemical pathways and hit the pineal gland. And when they hit the pineal gland, they cause you to sleep better. They increase your learning capacity. They also increase your mood. In tomorrow's lectures, we're going to look in detail at sleep and we're going to look at these things. Your eyes need the sun because the sun goes through to the brain and hits the pineal gland to help you sleep better, but also the pituitary gland, and that helps to balance the hormones. It was probably about 15 years ago, a group of scientists discovered a receptor site on the eye called melanopsin. And melanopsin is not involved in sight. Melanopsin is involved in brain function. Melanopsin absorbs blue light, and the highest source of blue light comes from the sunlight. And they found when adequate amounts of blue light are going into the brain, tactical reasoning increases, the ability to solve mathematical problems <laughs> increases, all because the sunlight's coming through the eyes. 
Now, I don't suggest you look at the sun. Our eyes tell us not to do that. But I must say, doesn't the sun rise and the sun set draw our sight there? So that early morning and late afternoon light draws the eyes there. And what the researchers are showing now is that morning and evening light has a healing effect on the brain to reset the circadian rhythm. Dr. Neil Nedley, in his book, Depression Away Out, he gives a story how he found that about 80% of his depressed patients, their circadian rhythm was out. The circadian rhythm is the rhythm that our brain runs at. Basically, it's set by the, the tides, the moons, the, 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 uh, the light and the dark. And he found that when your eyes experience the first hour of light in the day, that resets your circadian rhythm. You have a look at a lot of people that suffer from depression. They go to bed very late, so they get up late, so they never get the first hour of light in a day. So the sunlight is the highest source of blue light. There is another source of blue light, but this blue light has a different frequency to the blue light from the sunlight, and that is the light coming off screens. So the worst thing a person can do in the middle of the night if they can't sleep or even late in the evening is to allow their eyes to look at the screens. If you're in a room and the, the lamps are low and you've got soft music and you're, you're reading a book, it's easy to fall asleep, isn't it? That's a nice way to fall asleep. But if you're in a room and the lights are bright, the television on, and then you're looking at your iPad or your phone, especially in the ads or the break, the message to the brain is, wake up, time to move. <laughs> That's the very time when we should be slowing down. So be careful what your eyes are exposed to because it gives a message to the brain. Our eyes are an extension of our brain. And eyes are wearing out. And one of the reasons eyes are wearing out is they have too much short-range vision and not enough long-range vision. The muscles in our eyes, the short and long-range muscles, are set by the age of 11. I was talking to an eye doctor and she said, we are very concerned about children's eyesight today because their eyesight is set, the long and short range are set by the age of 11. And she said, traditionally, children were outside a lot. So they're, what they're viewing is a lot of long, a long range. But she said today, so many children are inside. And how many parents say, no, it's not safe out there. It's too dangerous to climb the tree. It's too dangerous to ride your bike. You might fall over and hurt yourself. No, come inside and watch this or play this game. And what's going into their brain is far more dangerous than a broken leg. You heal from a broken leg. But some of the things that are going into children's brains from what they're watching, that they will never heal from. Remember the Russian standards. Under the age of two, zero. Under the age of five, five minutes. Under the age of 10, 15, 20 minutes. Under the age of 15, we're probably looking at maybe an hour, 18, three hours. They're the Russian standards. Their scientists looked at this in detail and they looked clearly at the damaging effects, not only of what the child is watching, not only the damaging effect on their eyes and their short-range viewing, but also the child's, skull is, the child's skull is thinner than the adult skull. And so the, those electromagnetic Rays, those frequencies that are disruptive to our frequencies are going far deeper into the brain than an adult skull, which is a lot thicker. A lady said to me, my son, he can't sleep. So I began to investigate. Why? I said, what time does he go to bed? She said, 8.30. I said, when does he wake next? She said, 11.30. What's my next question? <laughs> what does he do? <laughs> Oh, he gets his iPad and he um, plays games. How long does he do that for? She said, oh, about two hours. And then he goes back to sleep. I said, aha, I have the remedy. <laughs> I found the cause and I have the remedy. She said, what's the cause? 
I said, his eyes are looking at that blue light, which is telling his brain, wake up. I said, the remedy is get rid of the iPad. No iPad. (laughs) Also, parents, turn the Wi-Fi off. Turn the Wi-Fi off 8.30 at night. That's a good way to get your teenagers into bed. And have a rule in your home, no technology in the bedroom. But, but I'm doing an assignment, we'll come out in the lounge room. You can do it in the lounge room. <laughs> we'll make it comfortable for you in the lounge room. So I said, for your son who can't sleep, n- no more technology in the bedroom. He can have a soft light. If he wakes up, he can read. And not an exciting book, maybe a book about the life habits of the Australian platypus. Not something terribly exciting. See, that that dull light is not going to interfere with his circadian rhythm. It will be a little hard at first because his brain, his cells are in the habit. But little by little by little, he will get out of the habit. And you can give him a little valerian. Valerian is a herb that is a mild tranquilizer, mild sedative. And it's very easy to retrain children's brains. Tomorrow we're going to be looking at insomnia. It is a huge problem today and one of the reasons is the, uh, the principles I just discussed in the story of this little boy. People are watching those screens till late at night, giving their brain the message to stay awake. Your eyes need sun and your eyes give a message to your brain. I was discussing recently how I get over jet lag. I flew into the US on Good Friday. Did I get jet lag? First night I slept like a log because you hardly sleep on the flight. Second night I was awake till 3 a.m. Not uncommon. I had to retrain my, my brain, my eyes, my body. But what I did, the day I got home and the following day, I sat in the sun for half an hour. I allowed the sun to touch my face with my eyes closed and I put my face straight into the sun with my eyes closed. Those ultraviolet rays from the sun, especially the UVB, they went through my eyelid and into my eye, resetting my body clock. And then I opened my eyes and sat there and I think I read or held on to my little granddaughter or maybe sometimes I sew. But I try and be out there for about half an hour and I'm not looking at the sun. Remember in the middle of the day you cannot look at the sun. The only thing you can do is close your eyes and put your face up there. I did that every day and I only had one night where I was awake till three in the morning. And I do not sleep in the day. If I'm falling asleep, I might allow myself 15 minutes hmm, before 11 o'clock in the morning, but never in the afternoon. But what I'd prefer to do if I'm falling asleep, get up and go and play with my little grandchildren because I was with my daughter for a month when I first came here because it was uh, to visit her predominantly that I came here. And I reset my my circadian rhythm through the light of the sun. I found that incredibly effective. As you can see by what we've looked at today, the sun is not the enemy in the sky. The sun is the doctor in the sky. We need the sun. We need the sun for our skin. We need the sun for our bones, for our teeth. We need the sun for our eyes. We need the sun for our brain. So please re-look at the sun. Enjoy it, value it and love it. Let it on your body. Not too much if you've got milky skin like me. Let the sun inside your house. Let it purify the air. Please enjoy the sun.